Well, here we are on Monday night and it is raining outside and just the sound of it on my back porch is so relaxing. So I decided to bring a couple books out here and do some reading. And uh, a thought occurred to me that I might want to try something I've never done before, which is just turn on my video camera and sit out here and talk to you guys with no planning or forethought about what I'm going to say. So I thought maybe I would combine the two things, reading my book and talking to you. And um, I'm going through about three different books. I have two of them with me here at the moment. One is on Epictetus, his discourses, it says Discourses and Selected Writings, and another one called Faithfully Different by Nat Natasha, <laughs> Natasha Crane. Both of these are really good books. But uh, let me go through some of the things I've highlighted in this book and see if any of this resonates with you. And I hope you enjoy the sound of the rain as much as I do. All right, let me read a couple things to you from Epictetus. The possession, the possession of a particular talent is instinctively sensed by its owner. So if any of you are so blessed, you'll be the first to know it. Do you have a, do you have a talent that you, in yourself, that you can instinctively sense? I would say for the most part, most of my life, I, I never have. So this, this is not a real relatable quote, but it does make me think makes me wonder if if maybe there has been some latent talent there all my life and didn't know about it. And according to him, I should. I should instinctively sense it. I would call that a gift. Not the sensing, but the talent itself. One of the questions I asked years ago to a man I really respected, I was, I was, I was probably a teenager when I asked him to say, if you have a talent and you don't use it, do you think that's a sin? And he said, well, I think that if God gives you a particular ability and you know what it is and you don't do anything with it, I think it's irresponsible. So therefore, yeah, in a way, I think it is kind of a sin. What is your talent? Do you have a gift or a talent that you instinctively sense? I'd be curious to know. What are your thoughts on that anyway? Because... I'm not, uh, I haven't swung the gavel down on it yet. He says, but if we are endowed by nature with the potential for greatness, why do only some of us achieve it? He goes on to speak a little bit more and he says, in short, we do not abandon any discipline for despair of ever being the best in it. Um, he, he basically said, you know, what he was saying here was just because you have an ability and you can't necessarily be the best in it, doesn't mean you stop doing it. People with perfectionist tendencies, I, I, I believe, are who he's talking about here. I'm one of these people that I'm all in. Whenever I do something, I'm all in. And I always want to represent whatever I'm doing and myself well. And so I do have a desire to, to, to do things as well as I possibly can. And if it falls short of my expectations, I'm very discouraged and very disappointed. According to Epictetus, we should just keep right on moving. If, you, if, if I read more of this passage to you, you'd understand what I was saying or what he was saying. Hmm. So we don't abandon any discipline just because we're not the best in it. He goes on to say in another passage here, he says, since everyone will necessarily treat things in accordance with their beliefs about them, those few who think that they are born for fidelity, respect, and confidence and their use of impressions entertain no mean or ignoble thoughts about themselves, while the majority does the opposite. Well, he's, he's kind of saying what the Bible verse uh, says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. People oftentimes will act in accordance with their true nature, whether they realize that's what they're doing or not. And sometimes our true nature needs a change. But it changes with change in the way we think about ourselves, how our impressions of the world and the definitions we give things. 
So if you believe what he's saying here, basically, if you believe that you were born for fidelity, respect, and confidence, you're going to act in accordance with the nature of those things. The problem with a lot of people, when you see them act the way they do, you have to realize from what he's saying here that innately or inherently, they really believe that this is who they are, or this is what they're born for. They might claim that life has turned them into this and that and thus and the other, but it's something they've come to believe, and so they're going to continue acting that way. He says in another passage here, he says, If you aim to be perfect when you are still anxious and apprehensive, how have you made progress? Let's see some evidence of it. But no, it's as if I were to say to an athlete, show me your shoulders, and he responded with, have a look at my weights. Get out of here with your, we can get out of here with you and your gigantic weights, I'd say. What I want to see isn't the weights, but how you've profited from using them. Earlier in this passage here, he was talking about people who like to talk about reading books and studying under certain philosophers. And how they, like to, they just like to talk about it. They like to say that this is what they do. They study under Chrysippus or, or Plato or Socrates. And he says, I don't want to hear about what you've read, how many books you've read, how many books you have, or who you've sat under. I want to see what you've done with what you've been taught. You know, this is one of those this is one of those areas where I have to question if I'm guilty of that myself in some respect. Probably. Probably. It's important to apply what we learn. And in the end no one's gonna care about our associations or how many books we have on the shelf. It might make people curious about us, but it won't really tell them anything about who we really are. And it certainly won't have an influence or an impact upon their life in a meaningful way that will help them. He says here, for what else are tragedies but the ordeals of people who have come to value externals, tricked out in tragic verse? I don't know if I want to comment on that much. I just like the way it's written. Enough to have highlighted it. Here's another one. If a man objects to truth, if I'm, let me say that again. If a man objects to truths that are all too evident, it is no easy task finding arguments that will change his mind. This is proof neither of his own strength nor of his teacher's weakness. When someone caught in an argument hardens to stone, there is just no more reasoning with them. Most of us dread the deadening of the body. <laughs> Most of us dread the deadening of the body. And we'll do anything to avoid it about the deadening of the soul, however, we don't care one, one iota. Do you, do, you, do you find yourself arguing with people, walking away and saying, well, that didn't do any good. I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to engage in an argument with that. It might be your spouse, right? How many, times you, how many times have you guys done that with your wife? And you walked away and said, I'm never doing that again. And you repeat the matter later on. I'm not saying she's guilty of anything one way or the other. She probably feels the same way about you. But there are plenty of people we could argue about. I mean, look how many things there are to talk about in this world. With all the political machinations that are going on. People on different sides of the aisle about everything. And everybody has an argument. And everybody has a side. And everybody thinks they know what the facts are. They have their evidence all lined up. The evidence still has to be interpreted. And that's where the rub comes in. You know when someone's open to conversation. You know when someone's open to discussing interpretation. But you also know when they're not. 
Don't waste your time arguing with people like that. There's no point. Keep yourself off of blood pressure medication. <laughs> Don't argue with people that there's no point arguing with. You go back to that one he said thing he said here. Most of us dread the deadening of the body, and I will do and, and will do anything to avoid it about the deadening of the soul. However, we don't care one iota. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the of the passage where uh, in the Bible talks about uh, selling, basically um, losing your soul. It's not talking about where you're going to spend eternity. It's just about selling yourself out. It's incredible. The, the, the statement is so true. In the same vein, Epictetus goes on to say here, Can I go on reasoning with such a person? What fire or iron can be applied to him to make him conscious of his condition? He senses it, but pretends he doesn't. That makes him even worse off than a corpse. One person does not notice a contradiction in his reasoning. Um, yeah, one person does not notice a contradiction in his reasoning. He is unfortunate. Another person notices it, all right, but does not budge and does not back down. He's even more unfortunate. His sense of honor and truthfulness has been excised, and his reason not excised, but brutalized. Am I to call this strength of character? I can't any more than I can apply the same name to the strength of degenerates that enables them to say and to do in public whatever they please. One person does not notice a contradiction in his reasoning. He is unfortunate. <laughs> Another person notices it all right, but does not budge, does not back down. Yeah, stubbornness, that's... um. The willful stubbornness of people is what makes them even more unfortunate than the ignorant. Hmm. Can you think of anything that you're willfully stubborn about? Are you too proud to ever change your position on anything where evidence is shown that you stand in the wrong? We're probably all guilty of that. The rain's dying down just a little bit. I hope it picks back up. Here's what Epictetus says about providence. In this case, another word for creator God. He says, It is easy to praise providence for everything that happens in the world, provided you have both the ability to see individual events and the context of the whole and a sense of gratitude. Without these, either you will not see the usefulness of what happens, or even supposing that you do see it, you will not be grateful for it. You know, I was talking to a friend the other night, another fellow Christian. Him and I were talking, and we we're talking about how God speaks to us, and God speaks to us through his word, and I also added, and he speaks to us through the circumstances in our life, or our lives that unfold before us, the, the coincidences that occur, that remind you that he's watching, that he cares, and he's still there, and that something much bigger than us is having its way with my life and yours and it's a way of communicating and in those very moments i'm very grateful that i'm just a small peon <laughs> in this universe but i'm cared for so much just like you are what would we do without gratefulness i think i think i think it's obvious if we see it all around us people are miserable they're also afraid because if you can't be grateful, you can't see that something else is actually happening. 
you're attributing things to just coincidence and chaos, hoping that the dice will be rolled in your favor somehow, but by who? If you're going to be grateful about the things you observe in life, that you have, you have to be grateful to somebody for those things, right? And when you know someone is making these things happen, you don't feel so alone, do you? It's nice to know you're cared for. I'm just reading random things here. Let me share this with you. I highlighted it. I don't know how much I can comment on it. He said, nothing can trouble or upset me or even seem annoying. Instead of meeting misfortune with groans and tears, I will call upon the faculty especially provided to deal with it. Well, that's an... That's a position of resolve, isn't it? Nothing can trouble or upset me or even seem annoying. How many times I have tried to claim that, but I've never been able to convince myself completely. But he has a, he has a plan here. It's not enough to say that nothing troubles me, upsets me, or annoys me. He says, he has a backup plan. He says, instead of meeting misfortune with groans and tears, I will call upon the faculty, especially provided to deal with it. His point in the, all this was that God has given us strength. Maybe it's untapped. Maybe it's unrecognized. But he has given you strength and he's built it up over time, over years in you. And that's not a foreign concept to you, I'm sure. But so often we will encounter an interruption, a difficulty, um, a problem of some kind, and we'll grunt and we'll groan as though we really have no strength. And he's he just made up his mind that nothing's going to trouble him or worry him. He's going to tap into the strength that he has in him. I mean, you, that really takes a lot of thought. You You really have to dwell on that and be able to identify it. I have a feeling that having an attitude of gratefulness would help with that. If you know what I mean. What else did I highlight? He had some things to say about beards in here. I don't know if I'm going to get to it or not. I wish I had, I wish I could spot it. At the time I was reading the parts I'm referring to, I didn't have a highlighter on me, and now I'm trying to go back and find them. Well, I'm only, I'm only up to page 49 in this book. I've been taking my time working through it. On the other hand, another book I've been reading 
is uh, faithfully different by Nat Natasha Crane. Oh, well, I keep wanting to mess up her name. This is really all about how how Christians have fallen for the progressive message that has infiltrated our churches. Uh, they have uh, contaminated our churches and left us compromising our values and what we know to be the truth. And I've seen it go on for years. Um, uh, she's a tremendously good writer, Nat Natasha Crane, very good thinker, very organized in her thoughts and the way she comes across. Um, I thought she said some interesting things in here. I was amazed when I first started reading this. Um, what she had to say about the st statistics about people in our churches. Listen to this. According to the 2019 data, 65% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. But that's not promising, as she outlines here. That's not really saying a whole lot. It's crucial to recognize the results of this type of research are based on how a person self-identifies. Isn't that a term? <coughs> Isn't that a term that's widely used by everybody now? or a concept, maybe I should say. It's all about how we self-identify. She uh, talks about five different ways people will identify as a Christian. She says, someone, one way is someone who says they're a Christian simply because they were raised in a Christian home, even though they no longer have an active faith in Jesus. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't make one a Christian, but it is one of the ways people do identify. Number two, someone who generally agrees with Christian values but rejects core doctrinal tenets of Christianity, such as the resurrection. Um, yeah, the resurrection is absolutely essential. It is, it is the focal point of Christianity because if Christ didn't rise from the dead, none of this is true. There would be no reason to have faith in him because he said he was going to uh, rise from the dead. But if we don't, if he didn't do that, then was, this is all for nothing. A third way someone identifies as a Christian is someone who rejects the authority of the Bible, but considers themselves a Jesus follower. That's one of the things that annoys me a lot. I'm seeing, starting to see more of that. People who don't believe in the authority of the Bible, but call themselves a Jesus follower. It's not the Jesus of the Bible they're following then. Another, a fourth way is someone who considers themselves a Christian, but also holds various beliefs that are in significant conflict with a biblical worldview, such as reincarnation. Um, yeah, that's that's becoming quite prevalent, and it's, it's sad. Another way is someone who holds to the tenets of the historic Christian faith and is an active follower of Jesus. I, I would identify with that, well, that is what a Christian is. Someone who holds who, who, someone who holds to the tenets of the historic Christian faith as an active follower of Jesus. So, uh, she goes on to say, self-identification tells us little about how people actually function in culture and their personal lives because they tell us nothing about what people believe. Listen to these statistics. In 2017, the American Culture and Faith Institute conducted research to specifically quantify those who have a biblical worldview. Based on an, on an analysis of people's answers to 40 questions about spiritual beliefs and behavior, ACFI found that just 10% of all Americans have a biblical worldview. That doesn't surprise me. Millennials were less likely than other adults to have a biblical view on 19 of the 20 beliefs evaluated, with only 4% having a biblical worldview at all. Man. 
the American Worldview Inventory, I suppose you can look all this up if you wanted to, is an annual survey based on 51 worldview-related questions drawn from eight categories of worldview application. In 2020, they found that only 6% of all American adults have a biblical worldview. Among 18 to 29-year-olds, the number drops to 2%. Perhaps, perhaps even more shockingly, researchers found that just 21% of those attending evangelical Protestant churches have a biblical worldview. These are people attending churches. Only 20% or 21%. These are the people in your pews, in the seats next to you. Only 21% of them hold, they have, only 21% of them have a biblical worldview, with that number dropping to only 8% in mainline Protestant churches. I mean, it doesn't tell you how much the church has been affected and, and how many unreached people are actually sitting in the pews nodding their head in assent to the preaching from the pulpit. Uh, you just never know what you have. Barna Research uh, says they consider a person to have a biblical worldview if they agree that absolute moral truth exists. The Bible is totally accurate in all the principles it teaches. Satan is a real being or force, not merely symbolic. A person cannot earn their way into heaven by trying to be good or doing good works. Jesus lived a sin sinless life on earth, and God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules, rules the universe today. I'm in agreement with the author of this, that that is too narrow of a definition, but I do... Uh, I do identify with all those things here. But he goes on to say, Barna found that only 17% of Christians who consider their faith important and attend church regularly hold to a biblical worldview. Let me say that again. Listen very carefully. Barna found that only 17% of Christians who consider their faith important and attend church regularly hold to a biblical worldview. Only 17%. To be clear, that's not 17% of all Americans or even 17% of all Christians. That's 17% of Christians who consider their faith important and attend church regularly. Seven of 10 people may say they're a Christian, but that in no way reflects the relative rarity of the biblical worldview in America today. So that's what this book is talking about here. Uh, there's a lot more, a lot more. And um, she does a great job of, uh, of discussing the issues of today. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to share. The rain kind of died down here. Oh, I've, I've highlighted a lot in this book. Hmm. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed, and, and I think it was chapter two, had chapter three, she talks about secularism, secularism, and what it actually is. It's used in a couple different ways, and and uh, she does she does a great job of defining it, and uh, talks about how you know people think that you know we call the we say that there's a secular world, which is a, a world that doesn't necessarily hold a a religious worldview, but however. It, it is in and of itself a religious worldview. It is a it is a belief system. It's a it's a religion of a type. And um, uh, anyway, she does a great job of that, and, and I, I'm really enjoying that book quite a bit. I really wish the rain would come down again a lot. But my suggestion is, guys, if you're not reading, first of all, if you're not reading, you need to start. And um, I I would suggest you know reading two, three books at a time. You don't have to read long in each one of them. What I, what I try to do to stay consistent is read about 20 minutes in each book every day. And um, you'll get through probably at least three books, at least three books a month by doing that. And, uh, but it really, it helps fill your mind and um, teaches you where, it teaches you how to delineate um, 
all the input that the world is sending your way. It also helps you to gauge your output, how to, to, you know, reading anything. It doesn't really matter what you're talking about, whether it's a book on theology or it's a book on philosophy, or if it's just a character-driven book as any kind of fiction book would be. Even those teach you something about life and about how to engage with others. And um, that's why reading is so important. Reading also helps you to not feel so alone in this world. When you see that other people, whether they're real or not in the, in the, between the covers of the book, um, they're going through the same thing you are. And somehow they make it, they navigate their way and you can take your cues from them. And, uh, you know, I just can't imagine not being a reader now. I know there'd be too much to miss out. It's not the same as watching TV. It's not the same as watching a documentary. I'm not taking anything away from that. There's a lot of good stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of good stuff on Netflix and Discovery and all that. You know, good, good doc. I love that kind of stuff. I do learn things from it. But uh, there's something about spending time pouring over the pages of a book that someone has really invested themselves in and not just for your entertainment. Not, and they're not trying to get ratings. They're just, they're just, they're just doing their life work. They're, they're fulfilling the desires of their heart by writing this stuff. This is what they're passionate about. These people work hard at it. And it's really, it's really somewhat of an honor to them. You know, I can only imagine if I was a writer and people were buying my book, what an honor that would be. You'd want to know that your work was fruitful. And um, that's going to be a frustrating career path to take, to be a writer. All the rejection you must get for a while. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of time, but uh, these are people who, these are people who are thinkers. So make sure you read, read often, read every day. Doesn't have to be a long time. Set a certain amount of time. Like, like, you could do what I do or do it for less or do it differently. But I read about 20 minutes a day in three different books. And what happens is, is, even though I'm reading three different books, and they can even be completely different kinds of books, and somehow or another, these ideas, these things I read about in the books, they're these, these ideas, these concepts, and these, these dialogues, they all kind of converge at some point and, 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 intermesh themselves um, and they become quite useful in my mind and it does help me get through life but um, anyway so I just want to take a little bit of time to relax out here the rain has died down and the dog is barking in the background not my dog someone else's it's pitch black out there beyond my screen but um yeah, I've enjoyed it. I've never done a video like this before. I hope you've enjoyed it too. I hope you found it relaxing, maybe a little thought provoking. And uh, tell me what you think. Give me your thoughts. If you didn't like it, you can say, Greg, please never do that again. Just, just don't ever make a video like that again. Or if you, if you did like it, you can say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe make a few more like this. And maybe I wouldn't mind. Um, but, um, Anyway, I am going to actually turn this off and I'm going to get into my books and uh, spend some more time reading before I go to bed tonight. I'll probably get a big bowl of Bluebell ice cream. I'm just so stuck on Bluebell that nothing else tastes good to me anymore. It's a vanilla bean. I'm going to pour some hard shell chocolate over it. I wish I had some salted peanuts I could put on top of it. How do you like your ice cream? What's your favorite kind? What's your favorite flavor? I would say uh, vanilla is my favorite, um, but I also like buttered pecan. The great thing about buttered pecan is nobody else in my family really likes it, so I get it all to myself. I never have to wonder if there's anything left in the freezer. I know whether there is or not if I got buttered pecan in there. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm just going to try to enjoy the rest of my night 
wind down even more before I go to bed and um, get up and do this all again tomorrow. All right, guys, have a good night. Stay safe. Be wise.